call to worship this morning as it comes to us from Psalm 36, verses 7 through 9. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've delivered us from sin and death and given to us everlasting life. We thank you for the indwelling of your spirit. And we do pray that you would strengthen us for worship this day. We pray that you would receive us through the atoning death of Christ on our behalf. And we pray for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's hear God's salutation. Grace, mercy, and peace be with, be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Rick will introduce our first hymn. Our first hymn is, O, o Come My Soul, Bless Thou the Lord, number six.
get together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. 
I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. John 6, 24-35 So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, but whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Father, we do thank you for your word and for the promises of the gospel. We thank you that in Jesus we have the manna, the bread of life. We thank you that in him we have salvation, which is that which truly nourishes the soul and springs up to eternal life. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us grace to trust in Christ 
and the provision you have made for us in him. Help us, O oh Lord, to look to the cross, to see there the one who died for us, our great mediator, the head of the covenant, the one who was appointed by God for our salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sufferings and death for us. We thank you that you are faithful to the will of your Father. You obeyed him perfectly by going to that cross and enduring a shameful, uh, painful death. We thank you that you did that out of obedience to the Father and also out of love for us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you uh, even endured uh, death itself, going into the grave and being buried. But we rejoice that you were not left in the grave. We thank you, Father, that by your Spirit you raised Jesus from the dead. We thank you that in bodily form he walked out of that grave and appeared to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. We thank you, Father, that our your Son, our Savior, is now at your right hand. He is our great High Priest, and we rest in him. We thank you that he pleads for us, that he has his names on our hearts, even written on his hands. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to have mercy on us, that you would forgive us for our many sins. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for all the many ways in which we fall short of your perfect standard, ways in which we give in to uh, sin in all of its many manifestations. Paul, we pray that you would uh, grant us strength to trust in Christ, our Redeemer, uh, through the course of life as we go through various troubles of life. Help us ever to be fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us, O oh Lord, to look above to where Christ is seated at your right hand. And we pray, Lord, that as we view the glory of our Savior and His majestic power in the earth and His love for His church, we pray that you would comfort us in the midst of our sufferings and affliction. Uh, encourage us as we engage in your labor. We pray that you would instruct us from your word and empower us by your spirit that we would more and more reflect you in the world today. Help us to be effective in our world in uh, transforming hearts and lives and bringing a greater change to our world as many come to know the Savior whom we know and love. We th pray then for your blessing on our witness here. We pray, Lord, that as we uh, not only meet here on Sundays, but also uh, serve you in our various homes and communities through the week. We pray that the light of the gospel would shine through us and that you would add to your church those who should be saved. We thank you, Lord, for your care for uh, our elderly and for those who have been uh, afflicted by illness and disease and other things. We pray, Lord, that you would bring blessing and healing on, on them. We thank you for Heidi and for uh, your care for her over the past year. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, potential narrowing of the diagnosis of what she's uh, suffering from. We pray that as uh, she's had several lab reports and they've been uncertain uh, and is awaiting uh, results from another report, we pray, Lord, that uh, the doctors would have clarity on uh, what she is dealing with and pray, Lord, that you would bring her healing and help. We thank you that she is planning to return to school in the fall and to more normal activities. And we do pray that you bless her and that strengthen her for that. And we pray for your uh, blessing on uh, the Penridge, uh, or excuse me, the Plumstead Christian School. Father, we do pray that you would uh, be at work in our community. We think of the Penridge High School and the various elementary schools in this area. Pray, Lord, that you would. Uh, do a great work of uh, grace and revelation in deli delivering our, our schools from the, the evils of this world, the lies and uh, the falsehoods that percolate throughout uh, our country. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our teachers and administrators, that they would see and understand the truth and teach your children forthrightly uh, from a, a Christian perspective. We know that's a lot to ask in this world. But Lord, we do pray that you would bless those who 
uh, serve in public schools who may yet call upon you. We pray that you preserve and protect them, bless them. And we pray that you would preserve the young people of this community from the falsehoods that are at work uh, throughout our school systems, especially the idolatry of man as opposed to the glory of God. Father, we pray that you would be with Chrissy. We thank you for uh, watching over her in her surgery this week. Uh, we do pray for healing from that and pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, give her strength and health uh, as she has at least one more procedure before her in November. We pray that you would uh, encourage her heart, help her to trust in you and your providence, your care for her, and Lord, help her to commit her her safety and well-being to your hands. We pray for her husband, Mike, that you would bless him, strengthen him uh, as he cares for her, and we thank you for them. Commit them to your love and care. Father, we pray that you would be with Rhoda and Manuel, as Manuel is uh, experiencing the hardships of age. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to him. Uh, be with Larry Handy as well. We rejoice in the opportunity to see him briefly last week and pray, Lord, that you would give him comfort, grace, and strength. We thank you for his son, John, who's providing care for him. Uh, John and Estelle, we pray for your blessing on them and their house. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, watch over Larry. We pray that you would be with Rhoda, uh, strengthen her. She also has various challenges to her health. We pray, Lord, that you bring her healing and strength and faith to endure. And as there is the uh, possibility of moving to perhaps live with her son, uh, pray that that would go well, and pray, Lord, for your provision for her. Be with Eve Thomas, bless her and her family. Be with Dan Thomas, we pray, Lord, that your spirit would be at work in his life, that you bring healing to him and your blessing in his life. Father, we thank you for Justin, and, and pray that as he has been afflicted by problems with his feet. Lately, we pray that you would bring him healing. We pray that the medical care that he receives would be helpful for him. And we ask for your blessing on him and we pray that you would be able to restore him to fellowship here soon. Father, we pray that you would be with our women as they uh, plan for ways in which they can have fellowship with each other and perhaps serve the needs of the church. We pray that you would encourage them as they meet. I pray that there would be a great spirit of love and zeal to serve. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing on them. We thank you for our various ministries in the church, our Sunday school, our midweek meetings. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on them. Be with Rick as he leads our study this morning. pray that you would give him wisdom as he counsels us from your word. Father, we pray that you would bless our nation, deliver us from evil. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with your church throughout the nation. We pray that you would be at work in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, sanctify her. We pray, we pray that you would help us to be faithful to your word, to be discerning in terms of the times in which we live. Help us, O oh Lord, to uh, proclaim the gospel of Christ with clarity and with great power and the help of your spirit. We pray for like-minded uh, churches that you would bless and strengthen them as well and deliver them also from uh, the uh, heresies and uh, falsehoods that are uh, so much at work in our world today. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, those who serve overseas. We thank you for them and their commitments to you. We pray for Woody Lauer in Japan and his wife, pray that you would bless them as they minister the gospel there uh, in a country and a culture that has been so resistant to the gospel. We thank you for those who are being gathered there and pray, Lord, that you would build your church even in that uh, far eastern nation. We pray for peace throughout our world. We pray, Lord, that you would cause nations to uh, walk humbly before you. We pray that you would defend us from evil and the evil one. We pray that you would be glorified in us. We ask that you would teach us in all things to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Rick will help us with our next hymn. Sing when it is might the Lord. 360. Shall we stand? And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants, 
of all the Egyptians, as neither you, excuse me, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. They said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, but which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters, and with our, our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day. And all that night, when it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land, so that the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive my sin, please, only this once. And plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the land of e all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he did not let the people of Israel go. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and for the spirit who has inspired your word, uh, revealing it through Moses and bringing it to us even uh, at this day. We pray, Lord, that as we meditate on these things, that your spirit would bless them to our hearts and that we would be strengthened in our faith and equipped to love and serve you and each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The locust is a rather small insect, maybe about the size of your finger. It flies about and it moves around in swarms. Uh, most recently, in 2019, there's been a massive locust swarm uh, coming over the Horn of Africa. And when it first uh, came, the people of Africa quickly uh, made use of every pesticide that they had and threw it out and tried to stop the locust uh, swarm uh, with some success, but uh, also with great questions in terms of the impact of the pesticides on the locusts. Uh, what is the impact that some of these pesticides will have on other uh, insects like bees that are important to uh, the agriculture of Africa? Locust swarms are not anything new, of course, obviously. Uh, 
there have been many recorded over the last century. Massive uh, swarms of these locusts come across an area. Uh, typically, they come from Arabia, across the Red Sea. Uh, there have been swarms of locusts found as far off as 1,200 miles at sea, making their way uh, to a location. Uh, when they come in, they come with a density to them that uh, just goes and eats up everything that's there. It can be a devastating plague, uh, bringing famine and starvation to people uh, if it's unchecked. We've noted that there has been a rising intensity to these plagues that God is bringing upon Egypt. We've gone from God's warfare against the gods of uh, the, the waterway, the rivers, uh, to the, the gods of the earth, and now the gods of the heavens, the uh, uh, stars above, uh, the atmosphere as well. In this plague, you'll see that the uh, locusts come across Egypt being strong, driven by a strong eastern wind, and then another wind will take them and drive them back west uh, to be buried in the Red Sea. Uh, so you have God making use of nature against the gods of nature in Egypt. The nature gods of Egypt were designed to protect the Egyptians from just this very thing to provide prosperity and, and fruitful seasons and all these kinds of things. But what God is doing is taking the very things that they worshipped, the gods that they worshipped in nature, and using nature against them to destroy them. It's most ironic and yet also just. So what we have is the ongoing warfare between God, the God of the Hebrews, and the paganism of Egypt. And God asserting that he alone is God, he alone is Lord of all. And so the nature religion of Egypt, which finds gods in every little aspect of life, is being brutalized by these plagues upon Egypt. There's no reason to have faith in these false gods. The plague that will, will come to Egypt is a plague which uh, comes back in the pages of Scripture at, at different points in time. Uh, you have a plague recorded by the prophet Joel where uh, the army of the, uh, I believe it's the Assyrians is likened to a, a swarm of locusts coming across a country and destroying it. And then finally in the book of Revelation, in the ninth chapter, you have one of the plagues that God brings from heaven upon the earth, coming again in the form of locusts. And with the book of Revelation, you have many things which are given, uh, many images that are given, that are more symbolic in nature. And perhaps this plague could uh, speak of different ways in which God judges mankind, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. But here God instructs Moses and Aaron to once more appear before Pharaoh and to announce a plague on the land of Egypt. And the purpose of the plague is uh, given to us here in the opening verses of, of the 10th chapter. Uh, Moses and Aaron are to appear before Pharaoh and God says in advance, you know, be prepared for what you're going to face. I have hardened Pharaoh's heart so he's not going to respond to you favorably, despite the magnificent plagues that have already swept through the land of Egypt and devastated it, nonetheless, his heart is hardened. Perhaps he feels that he has been able to connive away to thwart God's purposes by once the plague hits, he says, I'm sorry, I sinned, please forgive me, please pray that the plague will go away, the plague goes away, and he's fine. He's still alive. So he doesn't care. He hardens his heart again. And once the plague is gone, he says, I'm not letting my people, if your people go, I'm going to keep all of them. And so God prepares the hearts of Moses and Aaron for what they're going to face. How often we need to hear what Scripture is saying here in terms of our own witness to our world and our culture today and to friends and neighbors as well. 
Is it not true that some folks, having heard the gospel, nonetheless hardened their hearts against it and refused to submit to that gospel in spite of all the different problems and troubles of life that they are experiencing? They're unwilling to submit to God and to His Christ. And therefore, uh, when you share the gospel with them, when you point to them to the hope of salvation, they're blind to it, they're uninterested. I remember having conversations with folks at times, and you can see the wall going up, <laughs> right in their eyes. They are not interested. They don't want to hear it. They want to move on to something else. The heart of man is desperately wicked. And except God change that heart, bring about a change by His grace, they will steadfastly resist the message of the gospel. That's a reminder that if we have a stubborn heart, if we are resisting God's purpose for us, if we are uh, in rebellion against God, Please know, it will not go well for you. Your stubbornness is no threat to God. He will accomplish His purpose. So, God prepares Moses and Aaron in advance for what they're going to face. As they come before Pharaoh, uh, God says to them, I, I want to show my signs in the land of Egypt to the Egyptians. So there's going to be a witness to the Egyptians. Even though their hearts are hardened, even though they will not respond to the, uh, to the hope that's given, uh, God is going to show His signs so that they will have no excuse. And again, God continues to do that today when we have fruitful seasons, when we have the sun rising, the rains coming down upon us. God shows His goodness and kindness to mankind, shows that He's one who will forgive sins if you repent. And these kinds of things leave mankind without excuse. Some think that, well, God will give them another opportunity when they die, or if they've never heard the gospel, then God will give them an opportunity when they die to hear the gospel, and that will be a second chance. There is no second chance. The scriptures tell us that it is appointed to men once to die, and after this, not a second chance, it's the judgment. And people today are accountable for that which God has revealed to them now. So these signs are, these plagues are assigned to Egypt, warning them, instructing them to repent. But I found it was very interesting to see that God had a concern as well for the sons and grandsons, or if you will, the children and grandchildren of the Israelites. This event where God rescues his people out of Egypt was going to be the great redemptive event of the old covenant period of time. It would be an event that is recorded in the pages of, of, of scripture hereafter of how God had mercy on his people while they were in Egypt in bondage to Egypt and God rescued them by powerful hand, brought them out of Egypt, delivered them from Pharaoh and his armies, brought them through the Red Sea, brought them into the land of Canaan, showing His great mercy and love. And so, this would be the great work of salvation under the Old Covenant period of time. It was a work that would foreshadow the even greater work that God accomplishes us for us in Christ, who delivers us not from Pharaoh, but from Satan, not from the kingdom of Egypt, but from the kingdom of darkness, who delivers us with a mighty hand from Him who was too powerful for us, who delivers us from death, slavery, and bondage to sin, and gives us the freedom of the sons of God, brings us into the kingdom of God, gives us everlasting life. And so what we see in Egypt, and deliverance from Egypt, is just a microcosm of what God does for us in Christ. And in fact, the purpose of God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt was to point to what He would do in Christ. This deliverance has no meaning in and of itself as some sort of political rescue of a people who are in bondage. 
That's not God's concern. There are many people who were in bondage at that time. Many people who were enslaved. God rescued Israel for a purpose. Point to the greater salvation that he provides through a descendant of Israel, a descendant of David, the son of David, Jesus himself. So this was the, the instructional material for the children and grandchildren of Israel. God hereby shows that he has a concern for our young people. He is a concern for them and their well-being. He is concerned that the faith of their fathers be passed on to the children and grandchildren. And so he places it right before Moses and Aaron, right here at the start of their national history, if you will, uh, and say that I have an interest in these young people and for the, the advance of the kingdom of God over the history of time. That is part of God's covenantal promise to Abraham in Genesis 17. I will be a God to you and to your descendants after you. God has a forward-looking interest in the advance of the kingdom through history and time. So God has an interest in your sons and your, your, grand, your, your daughters, your grandsons and your granddaughters and all who come from them. But they hear of the great works of God the great work of salvation. What would they say to their children and grandchildren? They would talk about how God uh, engaged in a warfare against Egypt and showed his wrath against the Egyptians. It's a reminder that God is one who holds us accountable for sin. And those who rebel against God will nonetheless face the wrath of God. So it is a warning to the children of the covenant. They should repent of their sins and not continue in rebellion against the Lord. God judges the wicked. So it's a great privilege for them to grow up within the life of the church. It's a great blessing for them to grow up and hear the word of God announced to them. God has a purpose for them. They should know that God is one who is just and will punish the wicked for their sins. He is also the Lord of the heavens and the earth. They need not fear the gods of this world. They need not uh, bow down to them. They should only serve the Lord himself. And so where there are many threats in the world today, in a variety of forms that come to us, we should not bow down to them. So God was intending to instruct young people in the work, in his great work, reminding them that he's a just God, that he's also their Lord, who has dominion over the earth. So Moses and Aaron come before Pharaoh and they announce the plague. They tell him, they walk into his presence, they tell him, uh, first they raise a question, how long will you stubbornly resist? How long will you refuse to repent? It's like Moses and Aaron are getting frustrated here and saying, look, what is it with you? You've had all these things coming after you and you still don't get it. You still don't repent. There's a problem here. Don't you see it? There is a sense of impatience here on the part of Moses and Aaron and the Lord himself when they come into Pharaoh's presence. Sometimes we need to reflect that impatience with others and rebuke them. You've heard the gospel many times. When will it take root in your heart? When will you repent? How long will you resist? How long will you run after the things of this world and not come and follow after Christ? And so they raise that important question, trying to get through Pharaoh's thick head. He's refusing to listen. How long is it going to take for you to hear? Natural man's ears are plugged such that they don't listen. So they announce the plague to the Egyptians, to Pharaoh, 
They tell what's going to happen to them. They tell when it's going to happen. This will happen tomorrow, so this is not an ordinary thing. But I'm telling you when it's going to arrive, before you can see any, ed ed any evidence of it. And then what does Moses and Aaron do? After they announce the plague to Pharaoh, they don't sit around and listen to what Pharaoh has to say in response. They turn on their heels and walk out. It's like they have had it with Pharaoh. There needs to be a certain manliness about those who deliver the message of the gospel. There is a time to say, you have to listen. This is on your shoulders. There's nothing more I can do for you. Move on. Jesus says that if we go into various, as his disciples go into different communities and they resist the message of the gospel, shake off the dust of your feet and move on. There comes a point in time when it's time to say goodbye. People need to hear that we're not fooling around. This is not something that we're playing with. This is life and death. So Moses turned about and they walk out. And that has an impact on Pharaoh and his uh, friends there with him. They say, <laughs> the friends come up to Pharaoh and say, how long are you going to let this go on? The man is destroying Egypt. We've got nothing left. Why are you going to resist him now? Even his own servants have had it. They're frustrated. They're saying, listen, you got to pay attention here. We are being devastated by all these plagues. And there's no question in mind now about whether these locusts are coming. So what does Pharaoh do? Well, he senses the political climate. He realizes that he's kind of overstepping himself. And so he sends messengers to get... Moses and Aaron, before they leave the palace, hey, come on back. We need to talk a little bit. Let's negotiate. It reminds me of the sales situation where you go to the car dealer, you lay down your offer for the car, he doesn't like it, you stand up and you walk out, and then you say, oh, wait, let me talk to the manager before you go. They call Moses and Aaron back in, like they're going to negotiate here. Well, there's no negotiation on the part of Moses and Aaron. They say, you can let the men go out, but keep the women, the women and children will stay here with us. And let the men go out and worship. You see how in Egypt, first, there is a, a realization that the real prize is the children. That's the link that's going to hold the men there in Egypt. And so they're going to hold the children hostage, the wives as well. Make sure that these men come back. And so they try to put their grip upon the children. And this has been ongoing in our culture for the last century as uh, humanists have made their way into our public schools and dominated the way that they've been teaching. And they have locked up our children in these public schools. Fox News reported today that a woman was sending her child to the kindergarten up in, I believe it was in Rhode Island. And she asked the, the school, are you going to be teaching my child CRT? Critical race theory. She wanted to know. Simple question, why don't you be open and honest enough to say, what are you going to teach my child? The response was, to find that out, you have to go through a lawsuit that's going to cost $75,000. Can you believe it? Just want to know, what are you teaching my child? They didn't want to say. So you know what they're going to be teaching her child. They will be teaching her critical race, her child critical race theory and all that goes on with it. They'll be teaching acceptance of the transgender movement, uh, the gay uh, agenda, all these kinds of things, feminism, because that's what's in our public schools, that's what's dominating our public schools, and they're holding children captive. So, 
Pharaoh engages in this maneuver of trying to section off the children and, and the mothers as well, so that the men can go and worship, but leave the rest of them behind. Moses and Aaron effectively say, no. We're going out with our young and our old, with our women, men, everybody is coming out. Even the cattle are coming out with us. We're all leaving. God has a comprehensive plan in terms of His gospel. He reaches the whole family, the whole of life, and He calls us all to live and to follow after Him. And so He has a great interest in the work of the gospel within families. This is why, in part, we are Presbyterians and not Baptists. Uh, not to say that Baptists don't care for their children, but there's a covenant responsibility that parents have for the children. They should be receive the sign of the covenant, baptism. And they should come under the uh, promise that parents take in our churches to teach their children the word of God. And to bring them to, to worship. To be a part of God's kingdom. They're not strangers to the covenant just sitting around there with us. They are members of God's house. And God has an interest in them. They are holy to the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7. So, God has an interest in our children. That they be educated and brought under the Lordship of Christ. So, Moses and Aaron leave. God instructs them to lift up their hands over Egypt. A great swarm of locusts come the next day, uh, driven by the east wind. They come and they devastate the land. Pharaoh and his people recognizing what's going on uh, have a quick change of mind and say, Moses, come back in, please pray that the, this plague would end. And Moses amazingly agrees and prays for them again. Do you see how persistent we need to be in prayer even for those who have been steadfastly resistant to the gospel message for years? Continue to pray. Continue to pray. And God will hear and answer. I think of Augustine's mother, Monica, who prayed for her son for years and years as he went off and explored all kinds of wickedness and immorality and philosophy, false philosophies, and so forth. And finally, I think it was about 30, 32 years of age or so, he comes to faith in Christ. Never give up praying. Keep praying. God has a purpose for your children, your grandchildren alike. Well, even after this, Pharaoh hardens his heart and refuses to let Israel go. But we have in this plague a reminder of the power of prayer as Moses and Aaron lift up their hands to heaven. They are like the Christ himself who prays for his people. In John 17, he prays for his church that they would be kept from the world, from the evil one, and be preserved, go through this world. He is our great high priest in heaven who intercedes for us and brings us his blessings in life. We have one who prays for us, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And his blessings are for his church and for her children. When folks began to bring their children to Jesus and the Gospels, the disciples didn't want them to disturb Jesus. Jesus doesn't have time for the women and the children. Keep them to the side. He has more important things to do. He has to deal with the men. That was not Jesus' attitude. He said, let the little children come to me. In fact, babies were being brought to Jesus, Luke says. Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Christ loves the little children. They are his. And he has a purpose of grace in mind for you. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your blessing on our families. We thank you for our children those who have grown up and started families of their own, and for their children, and perhaps even for great-grandchildren, 
Father, we do pray that as we think of our families and the blessing that you have given to us and children and grandchildren, and perhaps even great-grandchildren, we do pray that your spirit would be at work in each young heart. We pray, Lord, that you would bring them to faith in our Savior. We pray that they would receive the message of the gospel and rest in Christ alone. We pray that you would defend them from the evil one. And we do pray for uh, us and for parents and for uh, others that as we teach our children, we would teach them faithfully of all the mighty things that you have done, including your judgments against the pagan world and your great work of salvation for your people. We ask for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand and sing? Glorious things of thee are spoken. 345.